Suppose a factory produces light bulbs and two machines A and B are responsible for producing them. Machine A produces 60% of the bulbs while machine B produces the remaining 40%. Machine A produces defective bulbs at a rate of 5% while machine B produces defective bulbs at a rate of 3%. If a randomly selected bulb is defective, what is the probability that it was produced by machine A? Okay, thank you so much for being here today with us, Aparva. Can you quickly introduce yourself for our viewers? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Apoorva. I currently work as a data scientist in a tech company in the ads team. So my team's focus is to ensure that our ad quality is high supply. Um, and we also think about how to increase ad revenue at, while at the same time making sure we don't affect user experience too much. Perfect. So it sounds like you have a lot of experience with analyzing data on the job. So I'm eager to see those skills being applied today. So our first question today is, suppose a factory produces light bulbs and two machines A and B are responsible for producing them. Machine A produces 60% of the bulbs while machine B produces the remaining 40%. Machine A produces defective bulbs at a rate of 5% while machine B produces defective bulbs at a rate of 3%. If a randomly selected bulb is defective, what is the probability that it was produced by machine A? Okay. So, yeah, so reading this question, um, I can see that it involves calculating conditional probabilities um, because essentially we have to calculate the probability of a certain event given another event. So keeping that in mind, I think Bayes' theorem is what I would use to solve this problem. So I'll first start off by just writing the formula for Bayes' theorem. Um, so yeah, let me just go ahead and do that. And writing it out this way is what I find the most useful instead of just trying to memorize the, the formula because this essentially, um, at least for me, is easier to understand because all this is basically saying is that the probability of two, joint probability of A and B is equivalent on both sides. And that's just like the joint probability, but factorized using the chain rule, right? Yeah. So now that we have the equation written out, now I'll fill in each of these, um, these conditional probabilities. So I think there are a few different, so ultimately the probability that we need to estimate is um, what is the probability that if, that if we select a, given a bulb is defective, what is the probability that it was produced by machine A? Okay. So essentially give, so what we need to find is PD given A where D is the probability of being effective, or sorry, being defective, and A is the probability that it was produced by machine A. Okay, yeah, can so we write we, out what each of the events are? Yeah, mm -hmm. so this is what we need to find out. And in order to do this, we need P A, which is the probability that the bulb was produced by machine A, and that is 60%. So that is equal to 0.6. Do you mind uh, writing out P. like what each of the random variables represents like A, B, and D? Oh yeah, sure. Yep, then PB is essentially one minus this probability. So that is 40%. So that and would then, be B, right? Probability that machine B produces the bulb? Yeah. Oh, sorry, yes. Mm -hmm. And then we've, we know that machine A produces defective bulbs 
at a rate of 5%, um, while machine B produces defective bulbs at a rate of 3%. So the probability of Oh, actually, sorry, I made a mistake here. We actually need to want to find a, a given D because here we know that randomly bulbs selected bulb is defective. So we actually want to find P probability that it was produced by machine A given D. Okay, we, ha you, we already have PD given A. Can you write out what D is. represents? Oh, yes. So P, this just represents probability that a bulb is defective. Okay. And we don't have this, so we'll need to calculate this, but I'll do that mm -hmm. once I write out the other uh, probabilities that we already know. Okay, great. So we already know P, D given A, and that is 5% I'll write it down. And we also know P, D given B, and that is 3%. Okay, so yeah, I think now we have, I've written down all the probabilities that we've been given. Mm -hmm. So now I'll first calculate P, D, because that's, uh, the one probability which we'll need to calculate and which is needed to calculate the for the final p probability of a given d so using the laws of probability pd there are basically two possible outcomes here in order to calculate pd that either the bulb was um, produced by machine a or produced by machine b so therefore the probability that the bulb is defective is basically PD given A times PA, which is basically if the bulb was produced by machine A, what is the probability that it is detective, uh -huh. defective or PD given B times times P, B. And we already have all of these values, so, mm -hmm. so I can just plug those in. So PD given A is 0 0.05 times PA is 0 0.6 plus um, PD given B is 0 0.03 times 0.4 and so I'll just use my calculator to calculate this but so this comes out to be 0 0.042 so now we can now we have all of the values needed to calculate uh, p a given d so I'll just go ahead and do that So P A given D, if we plug use plug if we use the base theorem, that'll basically be P D given A times P A divided by So yeah, so here this I basically just plugged in the values um, into the base into base the base theorem formula, 
And now we have all of these individual components. So I can just go ahead and plug those in. Mm -hmm. So PD given A is 0 0.05 times PA is 0.6. And then divided by PD, which we just calculated is 0 0.042. And so if I do this calculation, that comes out to approximately 5, five by 7. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that's our final answer. So, so, yeah, we just calculated what the probability of, given that a bulb is defective, what is the probability that it was produced by machine A? Okay, amazing. That sounds perfect to me, Aparva. Uh, so let's move on to our next question then. The next question is, what is the p-value? So p-value is a statistical concept used in hypothesis testing. And the technical definition of p-value is that it's the probability of obtaining test results at least as extreme as the result actually observed, assuming the null hypothesis is true. So in simpler terms, a smaller p-value indicates stronger evidence against the null hypothesis, um, while a larger p-value indicates weaker. Um, so I think to sort of give an example of how we would actually use p-value in practice, um, first, first of all, hypothesis testing. In hypothesis testing, basically, we're trying to understand if whatever treatment or intervention we're testing, um, if that has an actual effect on any of our key metrics or if the change we observe between the control group and the treatment group is just because of random variation. Okay, and you mentioned a null hypothesis. Can you explain what a null hypothesis is? So we usually have two different hypotheses in hypothesis testing. The first is the null hypothesis, which represents the default assumption that is the status quo, where we're basically assuming that there is no impact of whatever treatment or change we're introducing, while the alternative hypothesis uh, says that we think that there is actually a change um, based from our treatment or intervention. And so the p-value helps in deciding whether we can reject the null hypothesis based on the observed data, or if we do not have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I'd love to hear an example then of how you would use a p-value in practice. Um, so I can walk you through a more a concrete example. So say our null hypothesis, say we want to understand if the average or mean weight of apples from one orchard A is different from the mean weight of apples from another orchard B. So the null hypothesis in this case would be that the mean weight is the same for apples from both of these orchards. While the alternate hypothesis is that the mean weight of apples from orchard A is different from that of orchard B. And here we're just saying different, like it, which means it could be greater or smaller. Um, so we're not saying anything about the direction of, of this difference. So then we would, um, in order to, under, to test this hypothesis, we would basically collect a random sample of uh, apples from each orchard and measure their average weights. Um, so we would usually calculate the sample mean and standard deviation. And then we would conduct a two sample t-test um, to measure the means of these two samples, as well as calculate the te test statistic. So the test statistic is, we can think of this test statistics as basically a signal to noise ratio where the numerator is the signal in your sample data. And the numerator in this case is usually the difference in means. So in this case, it would be the difference between the average weight of apples um, from orchard A minus the, the average weight of apples from orchard B. Um, and then the denominator is the noise. So in this case, it would be the standard error. Um, which is basically a measure of variability. Um, so basically, all we're trying to do is understand if the signal to ra noise ratio is high enough, because if it's high, that means it's easier for us to distinguish the signal from the noise. 
um, which is ultimately what we're trying to do. Like basically we're trying to understand if we do see a difference in the average weights between these two orchards, um, in the average weight of apples between these two orchards, is that just because of random variation or is it actually because there is some difference um, between these two orchards, which is driving this difference in, in the average weight? So that's what the test, uh, that's what the test statistic um, basically helps us understand. So once we have the test statistic, we usually look at the T distribution table in this case, or use statistical software, um, and then sort of convert that into a p-value. So basically, the p-value here can be thought of as the area under the curve um, for this particular T distribution. And essentially what we're saying is that if the area under the curve is pretty small, that means that the probability that we would observe such a difference between the average weights given the null hypothesis is true, is very small. That means basically we're saying that in this case, we do not have sufficient evidence to conclude. Or in this case, if the p-value, and, and we compare this p-value to a significance level called alpha, which is usually set before we start hypothesis testing. And the standard for alpha significance level is 0 0.05, which basically means that um, if the null hypothesis was true, we would expect to find a test statistic as extreme as the one calculated by our test only 5% of the time. So essentially, if the p-value is smaller than alpha, that means the probability of observing such a test, give, such an extreme test statistic, if the null hypothesis was indeed true, is very low. And that means that we do have sufficient um, evidence to conclude that we can reject the null hypothesis, which means that we, if the p-value is less than 0 0.05, we do think that the mean weight of apples um, from orchard A is in fact different um, from the mean weight of apples from orchard B. And on the other hand, if the p-value is greater than 0 0.05, that means that there's a high probability that this, the t test statistic, the difference in te test statistic, or sorry, the difference in means that we're seeing is just due to random variation. And so we do not have it, enough evidence in that case to reject the null hypothesis. So that's how the p-value sort of helps us understand um, whether the effect we're seeing is tr a true effect or not. Okay. Yeah, and I guess like one extra point is um, we talked a little bit about how does the p-value actually relate to the t distribution, like explicitly speaking, and uh, actually the p-value can be computed from the um, inverse cumulative distribu distribution function of the t distribution, right? And that's why like we often look it up in tables instead because it's difficult to compute, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. So moving on, this is um, also a statistics question. What does the confidence level mean when you're building a confidence interval? When we make an estimate in statistics, there's always uncertainty around that estimate because usually in inferential statistics, um, you're essentially, whatever estimate you're calculating is based on a sample of the population you're studying. Mm -hmm. Like you usually don't have the data from the entire population, but instead you randomly sample um, from the population and then um, make an estimate, whether it's a summary statistic or a test statistic based on that estimate. So basically there's always some uncertainty around that estimate and the confidence interval helps us quantify that uncertainty. So the confidence interval is basically the range of values that you expect the estimate, your estimate to fall between a certain percentage of the time if you run your experiment again or resample uh, the population in the same way. So basically to use um, a conc more concrete example, if you construct um, a confidence interval or like say you perform uh, or, or you, ca you, you, calcul you come up with a summary statistic and then and you say the confidence level or confidence interval for that statistic, um, say falls between one and five. Mm -hmm. 
then essentially what that means is that if you repeat the test or if you sample the population, if you randomly sample the population multiple times, then for a certain percentage of time, you would expect the the mean the whatever statistic you were calculating to to fall between one and five. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. So then, um, how would the confidence level affect the width of the confidence interval? Yeah. So the confidence level is basically the percentage of times you expect to reproduce the estimate between the upper and lower bounds of the confidence interval. So in the example I was just saying, I was just talking about. If you set the confidence level to be, say, 95 percent, um, then that would mean that if you repeat the if you sample the population 100 times, then 95 out of those 100 times, you can say that the estimate will fall between the upper and lower values um, specified by the confidence interval. So basically, there's usually a trade off. Um, between the confidence level um, and the width of the confidence interval. Mm -hmm. Because a higher confidence level usually leads to a wider interval, because then we're more certain that the parameter of interest will lie within that wider range, whereas a lower confidence uh, level usually results in a narrower interval. But that also means that we're less confident um, that the interval contains the parameter of interest. Right. So, so yeah, I can also explain more with a more concrete example. So, so suppose we want to estimate the average height of um, adult males in a city. Mm -hmm. So obviously we can't go and um, we don't have data for each adult male in the entire city because that would be very difficult to collect. So instead we take a random sample mm -hmm. of around 2000 males and then calculate a 95% confidence interval for the population mean height. So let's say we do that and find that the inter and estimate the interval to be between 170 and 180 centimeters. So the lower bound of the interval is 170 centimeters and the upper bound is 180 centimeters. So here the conf a confidence level of 95% basically means that if we repeat this sampling exercise mm -hmm. 100 times, each time with, a two th with 2,000 males, that means we basically gather um, 100 samples or, or repeat the sampling exercise 100 times each time we're taking a random sample of 2,000 males. Then we a confidence level of 95% means that 95 times out of this 100, uh, sample, 100 times sampling exercise that we did, the mean will fall between the 170 to 180 centimeter range. 170 to 180 is your confidence interval for the 95% level, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So now let's imagine we reduce the confidence level to 90%, which means like, which means that we're okay with being slightly less confident um, about our results. Mm -hmm then in this case, we could potentially reduce the size of this, of the confidence interval. Like now it, we, since now we only need a confidence of 90%, which is lower than 95%, um, we could say that actually the, uh, the, the confidence interval is now between 172 to 180 centimeters, um, since we've reduced the, the level of confidence that we want. And conversely, if we want to be even more confident, like let's say we want to be 99% confidence, mm -hmm. uh, we want to be at the 99% confidence level, then um, obviously the confidence interval will need to be larger right. because then there are cases where, for example, if somebody is at 169 centimeters, um, like we would still, uh, essentially we would, the confidence interval would become wider because now we want to we, now we want to be much more confident that is we want to be confident at a 99 percent that means we would for example want to include uh, you, males who are also at say 169 centimeters or or 181 centimeters um, because we want to make sure we're accounting for as much of the 
as much of the um, popular or as much of the population that covers gets us to this 99% confidence level. Or perhaps it really just covers the um, variants that it can occur across the sampling procedures, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So then like the wider your confidence interval, the more likely it's going to capture that variance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Amazing. That's our last question for today. Um, thank you so much, Apoorva. Uh, I'd love to switch into our interview debrief mode where we're going to analyze this as if we were interviewers ourselves. So I'm curious to hear from you. What do you think went well and what do you think you would uh, change going forward? Yeah, I think for the, like starting with the Bayes theorem question, I think that like writing down everything um, and then sort of like walking through each step, I think that went well because then it becomes much clearer for both me as well as the interviewer to understand my thought process. Um, I think for the other two questions, I feel like I could have been a bit more clearer um, in, in both the structure of answering as well as sort of just like the phrasing I was using. Like I feel like it was some, maybe sometimes a little bit confusing mm -hmm. to to follow. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I really like though that in general you showed um, a, a really deep knowledge of all of these concepts that you explained um, hypothesis testing, even though I really only asked you about p-values and you could potentially explain that without delving too much into like hypothesis testing and like null hypotheses and so on. But you were really able to explain all of the tangential concepts really well. Um, and I like that you were able to answer like the follow-up questions about like, well, what happens if you increase or decrease your confidence level and so on. And I really liked your use of concrete examples to explain these concepts too, because I, I think that really made it more clear. Um, yeah, I agree. Sometimes for clarity, it can help to explain what your variables are before your calculation. So for instance, when you were saying that, okay, we need to calculate P of D given A, I actually didn't know what D was yet. So um, it just helps to just explain what all of those random variables are first. Um, yeah, and I think I was trying to ask about like what the explicit relationship between the p-value and the like t distribution is because you mentioned like oh we use this lookup table right to get um to look up what the p-value is based off of the t statistics but what exactly is that lookup table doing right and the answer was basically it's using the inverse cdf of the t distribution um yeah and other than that uh i really thought you did a great job and we've learned so much from you today so thank you for being here Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, and thanks everybody for watching. If you have any upcoming interviews, good luck. Bye, everyone. Mm -hmm.